everyone. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with Eric and Eric. Eric Squared. Yeah. Great to be back. Uh, Eric from Root Simple has joined us here. This is a kind of a spontaneous uh, coming in the minds. We both were um, lacking a co-host and we just kind of messaged each other and said, hey, what are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? So we uh, turned on the computer and we're going to do a dual podcast today. So welcome, everyone. Yeah, great to be back. It's like a podcasting bromance. <laughs> Today, guys, we're going to talk about um, what's it's like when the power goes out in L.A. And um, I was interested in a pizza class that Eric just took and whatever else pops into our heads. So welcome, everyone. And uh, welcome, Eric. Great to be back again. So you I, you guys have a site. It's called RootSimple.com. And what I like is that you guys are actually regular about posting content other than your podcast. And I need to get better at that. I'm trying to post a couple of text, text posts a week. But your power went out. And I would never thought about the power going out in a place like Los Angeles. I always think about the power going out when a tree is full of snow and it takes down a power line. But I guess the power goes out in other parts of the country, too. Well, it's the opposite problem. It was a really hot day, so I think everyone was using their air conditioners, and it just overloaded the the grid here. And uh, we're in an old part of Los Angeles, so everything's a hundred years old, and stuff um, stuff goes all, out every once in a while. We actually the the street over lost its water two weeks ago when a water line burst, but it it happens here. No no ice storms, but uh, heat heat will do it. Wow. So is there some tricks for staying uh, cool? Oh, I'm gonna, I was going to ask you that one. <laughs> uh, it's, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, this house that we're in was built in the 1920s. And I think when they were building houses back then, they couldn't put them up fast enough. So it's uninsulated. It's got, you know, typical of a 1920s house, it's got a lot of windows, probably too many windows, so it gets hot in here. So our strategy for dealing with the heat is to go to the library, <laughs> I hate to say it. We have one uh, window air conditioner in the bedroom, and that's it. Um, we do have, I actually put in a do-it-yourself whole house fan mm -hmm. in the attic, which does help. I mean, actually, in this climate, it, it works really well. Actually, I heard your co-host talking about that last week. But uh, it works in a climate where it cools down at night. And it does, thankfully, it usually does that here. So it, it uh, is not that humid usually, and then evenings are cool. And that's when I can turn that on. And basically, that's just a, I, I stuck a big fan. It's very, like, impromptu. I stuck a big fan in a hole in the attic uh, access door. And that fan basically sucks air in the windows of the house. So in the evening, what I'll do is open the windows, turn that fan on. It sucks cold air into the house or cool air into the house and pushes the hot air out of the attic. And it works pretty well. So basically, I'll look at the outdoor thermometer. And when the outdoor thermometer is cooler than the thermostat inside, I know that's my cue that I can turn on the whole house fan. I think if I had a larger space to stick in a bigger fan, I'd probably go with a, a whole house, a proper whole house fan. But just the, the quirky way that this house is put together, I didn't have the space between the, the ceiling studs to put one of those in so I, I stuck just a basically a big fan in and it works so you just like like got a, a box fan from one of the big stores and rigged it up in there yep. basically i took it out of its box it still has a cage around it uh, but i basically installed it in a, a piece of um, plywood that that goes where the attic door access door is and uh, in the uh, hot part of the year i'll switch out the normal attic door with the uh the fan the whole house fan basically. so for like 25 it, bucks you you made an attic fan yep exactly what this does um everyone that's listening the whole idea here is that you're 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 blowing hot air up into your attic and it isn't contained up there attics are actually vented um along the top of the roof if it's a recent house you might notice a little lip at the crown of your roof and that's actually um a small gap that lets air out. And also along the soffits and the gable ends, you will see these um, sometimes a round louvered 
round louvers or just screening. And it's all built on the idea of convection and that it cools off the attic a little bit. And the whole idea of this is to keep the house a little cool, yes, but to extend the life of your roofing shingles, really. Oh, I didn't know that part of it. That's interesting. And you learned something just calling the oh, East yep. Coast here. There you go. <laughs> I, it's kind of funny because I think um, my biggest way to control heat and cool is the indoor outdoor thermometer. And I own more than one. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I compare the indoor temperature to the outdoor temperature. And that's how I decide whether to open or close the windows. The, the nice part for this is that we both work from home. So you can, you're home to do it. But there are actually systems, there are fresh air systems. Uh, for forced air heating and cooling that will do this as well. They will monitor the outside temperature. Um, and there's a big uh, flat vent that with a motor and it'll open and close to bring in some air. And they also make these rigs to reduce the humidity in that air, which is very interesting. Which is more of a problem where you are, right? It's pretty humid in, in Brooklyn. Yeah, it's New England. It's it's not. It hasn't been too bad this summer, but um, it's kind of a depends on who you ask kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. I'm just stunned by the amount of cement we have around here, and it's a big, it's a big heat sink. Um, so it does yeah. cool. It does cool down, but um, man, what a difference if you're up in the woods. You know, when it cools down in the woods, it's really cool. Down here, you can still the cement just gives off heat all night. So yeah, yeah, I love it. I love the idea. But the other cool thing was uh, the power outage forces you to kind of interact with your neighbors. And it's kind of a, it's also just a reason to go see them. Yeah, I, you probably have this experience, too, where you are in, in at least your Brooklyn house. Is you, I, I know the neighbors here and uh, it was nice. It, the power went out. It the, kind of a party atmosphere develops, actually. <laughs> and um so, yeah, I went over just to find out what happened. And because we don't have a smartphone, which, you know, something, I don't know, maybe eventually we'll have to get one of those things. So we actually didn't know what was going on, whether it was a widespread outage or just a local one. So I went over to the neighbors. I also switched on my ham radio, which I don't use that much. Yeah. Uh, and I, I could tell that from the chatter on that, that it, it was not a serious situation. It was just a couple of blocks here. But yeah, the neighbors uh, neighbors told me that uh, the power would be back on at one a.m., which just about right on the dot it was. I have one of those uh, rechargeable AM/FM radios that has a little hand crank, a little Dynamo hand crank on the side, and uh, if all else yeah, fails, I've got that's one of those too. Yeah. That's my go-to AM radio. So you, because I, I knew you had bought that ham yeah. radio for, for kind of you know when the when the stuff hits the fan. There's a short term for that, but, um, but there isn't, it's not, I guess for some people it's a little more social and for people like you and I it might be more kind of an emergency tool. Yeah. It's something I, I just don't, don't have the time right now to devote to that, that, uh, pursuit. So I've kind of put that on the back burner, but I did get a license and, uh, I guess you could do pretty cool things with it every once in a while. I used to check in with the local. There's there's various nets that, that you can check in with uh, that are on a regular basis to kind of get some practice using it. Cool thing about that ham radio is it also has, you know, aviation radio and, and uh, police and fire and other things like that. So you can tune into that stuff too. Wow. Yeah, because when the, when the power goes out, the smartphone can be kind of useless. If, if the nearby cell towers... Um, don't have any power, then you're, you're toast with your smartphone. Kind of, although I hear they're, they're getting a lot more reliable than they used to be. Uh-huh. Uh, we still have a landline, and of course that's a separate power grid, and that's, yes. that's always working, it seems to, although I wonder how much longer that's going to be maintained. So I probably eventually will have to go the smartphone route. Come over to the dark side, Eric. Exactly. Yep. Hey everyone, real quick, if you do us a favor, go to your computer, log on to iTunes and write a review, a five-star review, hopefully, of Garden Fork Radio, and if you like, Garden Fork, the TV video show as well. We have two podcasts on iTunes. If you'd use words like DIY, food, podcast, cooking, gardening, that'd be cool too, right? So go to iTunes, say nice things about us. That'll really help us in the search on iTunes so more people 
can find Garden Fork and listen to cool stuff. Thanks. All right. Well, the last thing I wanted to catch up on with you is we were talking the other day and you had just talk, taught a pizza making class. And so what, I mean, what's your kind of overview on homemade pizza in your class? Yeah. So what I taught was uh, basically a variation on the tartine bread recipe. I don't know if you've ever fooled around with that. It's mm-hmm. a basic sourdough recipe. To make pizza with that recipe, what I showed people is using double O flour, which is an well, it's a, it's actually a little confusing as exactly what double O flour is. It means something a little different in the U.S. than it means in Italy. Is it a grind? Here, yeah, the double O refers to the grind. Um, and uh, in Italy, though, there's different double O flours. There's some for making pizza, and there's some for making pasta, so on and so forth. The kind that I have access to here is for making pizza, and it's a relatively high protein flour, so it's pretty glutinous, which means it's easier to stretch out the dough. Because if you use all-purpose flour for mm-hmm. pizza, it can it can kind of fight you. It'll you'll try yep. to stretch it out, and then it'll fight it fight its way back. So the double O uh, flour they use is is pretty good at you know it's pretty easy to shape, and um, also you could you could use bread flour too, which has the same uh, glutinous properties, the same high protein. Uh, it's easy to stretch out. So I showed how to do that, and it was a sourdough recipe. So basically, you make it with either bread flour or double O flour. Double O flour gives you more of a Italian style thin crust pizza, mm-hmm. and the bread flour is more of a New York style pizza, thicker crust. So whatever you want, and then uh, you let it rise for four hours, and then I like to stick it in the refrigerator because then you get this long fermentation in the fridge, which gives you a kind of a deeper flavor. Yep. And then you can also the next day you can you know take it out of the fridge and shape it and bake it whenever you want to. So that's what I showed, and then the other neat trick which I learned from a guy who calls himself the pizza hacker in San Francisco. Who is this really oh, cool just, guy. All right, I know that guy, yeah. Yeah, the guy that did the modified Weber grill mm-hmm. thing. You know that that trick with the it's kind of like a cement top for a Weber grill and uh, for, for baking pizza out on the street there in San Francisco. But he also has another neat trick, which is making pizza in a skillet on the oven. And I discovered this... On the stove top, rather. I discovered this. I was I was having some pizza, pizza, excuse me, some people over for pizza one week, and it started raining. So we couldn't use the outdoor pizza oven that I have. So we did it in the kitchen. And it's pretty simple. You shape your dough. You stick it on a skillet, like cast iron is my favorite, on the stove top with the burner on either medium to high, depending on your stove. Mm-hmm. So you... You put it in there, put just a small amount of oil in the pan, um, bake the pizza dough. As you're baking the dough, or excuse me, uh, as you're uh, frying it in the pan, essentially, you can top it. So about three minutes in the pan, and then you stick it under the broiler. Aha. Uh-huh. And what it does is it gives you that heat that a, a pizza oven has. And, you know, frankly, the pizza done this way is as good as the stuff coming out of the cob oven. It's like, why did I go through the effort to put together the cob oven when this is so easy to do? And it makes a really nice pizza. Because the problem with doing an oven, which I used to do, you know, with like a pizza stone, mm-hmm. is that the oven doesn't get hot enough. Right. And but the broiler gets really wicked well. hot. The broiler gets wicked hot, so you gotta you gotta really watch the pizza at that point, and you might have to adjust the height, you know, if if you can. Like in my broiler, I can adjust it a couple inches up and down. Uh, so in my broiler, it's another three minutes, and it's done. Your broiler, your your results may vary, but uh, that's that's how it works. Real simple, works great. It's the hottest day of the year here right now, and I, of course, now I want to fire up the oven. So. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, right? It was super hot at the workshop. And so, yeah, this is the time of year I kind of shut the bread and uh, pizza making down for a while. Or I do it outside. I mean, that, that brick, that temporary brick oven you have on your site is very cool, too. That's another nice way to do it. The portable brick oven gets, um, it's one of the most visited pages on the website. And, um, man, it's it's just kind of 
I can't claim to have invented it. It's a, it's a guy named Stuart who did it. And I always, you know, talk up him and his ebook. And it's just kind of this light bulb goes off in people's heads and they're like, I'm going to build that thing. And then at least once a week, I get an email from someone and I always ask them, send me pictures. And every once in a while, they'll send pictures. So I'm, I'm trying to create on the website, I think I have to use some kind of plugin to do it, but a neat gallery, a slideshow gallery thing of all the different pizza ovens that have been built by people that watch Garden Fork. Yeah, you should totally do that. I mean, it's nice to have an open fire like that, you know, for a group of people. It makes a nice, you know, kind of outdoor party thing that the that stovetop method doesn't have. But, you know, I'd say if you're just making pizza for yourself at home on a weeknight or something, uh, the stovetop way is, is the way to go. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of a fun, you know, you, you have a couple of bottles of wine and you're in the yard or the driveway and your neighbors come over and they're like, what is Eric doing? You know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of tricks for people. I, someone asks every week, can I bake bread in the, the portable pizza oven? And you really can't. It really lacks mass. Um, your cob oven has that. And there's, I've seen a couple of people try and block the large entrance of the portable pizza oven. And a couple have been successful at small loaves, but it just doesn't, it's not really built for that long term heat thing, you know? Yeah, it's not going to hold heat. Right, because the idea with the bread oven is you fire the puppy up, and then do you take the coals out and then just let the heat of the oven bake the bread? Yeah, exactly. You have to take the to coals totally out, and you have to fire it for a long time. So many hours, five, six hours sometimes, depending on the oven. Do you think pallet wood would be okay to burn in a cob oven? I mean, is that an okay kind of firewood? Is it, or do you need like hardwood? Well, I, there's varying opinions on that. I burn scrap wood to get it going. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, with pallet wood, you'd want to be careful where it comes from because some of it's treated. Yeah. So you, obviously, you want to avoid that. For pizza, you need hardwood. So what, what I'll do for a, for a pizza fire is I will start with scrap wood, pieces of two by four, things like that to heat the oven up mm -hmm. and then as soon as the pizza is ready to go in I'll switch to hardwood the reason being that that softwood will pop and that'll spread ashes on your pizza which you don't want all right uh, right so that's that's why I'll use hardwood while the the pizza's cooking is going on but then if you switch back to baking bread yeah you can you can just do two by fours and scrap wood and you don't need to use hardwood for that, been... especially since you're gonna take the fire out anyways I've been collecting pallets uh, for my maple syrup evaporator for next uh, next winter's boil. Oh, nice. It's kind of hard. Up in where our house is in Connecticut, a lot of people heat their houses with wood, so pallets are sought after, you know? <laughs> so I've been, uh, I've been collecting a lot of pallet wood, and I've been paying attention to the composition of the wood. And from what I understand, I think the pallets that are painted blue... It, I think for some people that means that they have been uh, used to transport chemicals, perhaps. I have to still have to research this more. But if anyone out there knows about pallets, we'd like to hear from you. It's radio you, at gardenfork.tv. You know who knows about pallets? I was just sent Deke Dietrichson's new uh, tiny house book. And I, I was just thumbing through it before you called, and there's a few pages on pallets in there. He seems to know, he knows his pallets. Oh, cool! I know Deke. We've, uh, I, we built yeah, plywood I you boats. Knew him. Yeah, and he's there. You go. He's been on the show before. He's, he's amazing. That guy has like, it's like he has caffeine in his veins all the time. Yeah, exactly. And he, he coined, I think it's his term is, obtainium. I love that that term for things like pallets. I love windows, it. stuff like that. Hmm. I'll have to get hold of Deke and uh, see if he can be on the show. He's always, he's just like Mr. Energy. So that's cool. And we'll go find out about his book. People don't yeah. send me books. You're like the, you know, I don't get books. You got to ask at first, but uh, just ask and they, they will send. All right, cool. All right, everyone, if you uh, want to ask a question, you can ask us at radio at gardenfork.tv and you can check out um, Eric's uh, site it's called rootsimple.com and uh, Kelly and Eric have a podcast as well it's uh, Root Simple on iTunes and I think you'll enjoy it by the way very interesting um, talk with the guy that has chickens and all sorts of stuff 
uh, it's a two-parter. Winnetka Farm, it, the two-part Winnetka Farm podcast was very interesting, I thought. Yeah, thanks. Craig's a really nice guy. So, so that was cool. All right, everyone. So make it a great day and uh, let us know your thoughts. See ya. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com.